I have a little bit of water left though. All right, looks like we're live. Yeah, there's our cue. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. I think we can go ahead and give it a couple of minutes. For everyone to jump on, get all of our stuff in order. Don't want to sit in silence for, for too long, but um, how is the the weather over in St. Louis? Oh, it's nice. Yeah, the leaves are starting to turn and uh, fall is starting. Um, I mean, the weather is, is fantastic, nice in 60s and 70s. So it's my favorite time of year to go outside and smell that fall air. It's just it's fantastic. I know, right? We were talking internally last week about just fall and how it means so much for us but you can see it so much in the dogs like the little extra pep in their stuff with the cool air and stuff so that always makes me super excited to see them like come out of summer lethargia and have right. a good time so yep. same on our side yeah especially those uh those walks in the park and uh, walks down to the pond and it's just seeing them run around it's pretty fantastic it's a pretty great time of year so that's for sure. For okay. sure. Well, I know we have a decent amount of content to cover. So I think we can go ahead and jump in. Um, wanted to say thanks again to everyone that is joining us for this really cool topic. Um, I'll start with just some general introductions of who I am and let Brian introduce himself. Um, but hello, I am Caitlin Figak. I am the marketing manager for Orvis Dog. Um, I've been here for just about six months, so pretty new to the Orvis team, but it's been an awesome experience, real great group of people. So super excited to um, be joining these, these sort of events and getting Orvis out there. Um, but I have also been a dog owner for the last seven years. I have two wonderful dogs. Um, I've got Brewer, he's a seven-year-old boxer GSP mix. And then we've got Guinness, who is around six or seven. We're not sure his exact age. Um, he's an Irish Setter, Britney Spaniel mix. So they keep us nice and busy, which is awesome. Um, and we, we love them. And it's a big reason of how I found Orbis. Um, so yeah, super excited to talk about, um, nutrition, especially for active dogs, since, you know, both of mine have a combination of a bunch of different bird dogs, boarding dogs, all kinds of stuff. Um, so, uh, really excited that Brian's here to talk about canine nutrition. Um, he is from the Purina Pro team. So Brian, I'll go ahead and let you kind of give a little introduction on your background and, um, what we'll be talking about today. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. So, yeah, so my name is Brian Zangi. Uh, I am a PhD in animal nutrition. I've uh, been with Nestle Purina for 16 years now. And during this 16 years, I have largely been in the basic nutrition department. And really what that means is that that group is responsible for discovering uh, different nutritional innovations for products, uh, whether it is uh, supplements or main meal foods, uh, but we largely focus on health-related uh, nutritional innovations. Uh, so that was actually the first 14 years uh, of my time with the company. The last two years, I've been in a global nutrition role, which is actually part of more of the product development team. Uh, but a lot of the work that I did during my 14 years of being in product of, in uh, basic nutrition actually revolved around canine exercise, nutrition studies, uh, understanding the nutritional needs of older dogs, uh, as well as some, some cat research. But a lot of my time was spent on, um, on canine research and, uh, and exercise nutrition. So 
So I'll show you a little bit about some of the research that I had conducted and then some of the work that some of my colleagues have con conducted and then kind of share uh, some of the work that some of our uh, veterinary colleagues in, in the field have also conducted in the area of canine research. So um, what led me to Purina is actually I went to University of Kentucky and got my PhD in animal nutrition there. I was there for four years and then had a short period of time doing a postdoctoral program in aging animals. And then after that's when I went, came to St. Louis and I've been with Nestle Purina the whole time. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to share this content, which I'm, I'm really passionate about. And so, so my pets, uh, cause you had shared about your pets. I have Aspen, who's a black lab. Uh, he is my uh, hunting buddy, also my adventure dog buddy. Uh, so I, I do a lot of dog training, uh, in my spare time. Uh, I was actually involved during my time in Kentucky to get the, um, the, uh, Kentucky, uh, hunting retriever club organization going um, down in Lexington. And so during that time, I was very involved with hunting retrievers and doing that sort of training thing. So that was really fun to be able to pair up my dog nutrition research at Kentucky and uh, a life passion. For your actual passion. Yeah, that's so cool. That's really awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so that that's who I am. And uh, yeah, and then I've got probably about 25 slides to talk through uh, different topics associated with performance dog nutrition. So looking perfect. Cool. Well, um, I haven't seen any questions or anything like that come through quite yet. So we can go ahead and jump in. But I did want to mention, feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat as we're going through the content. Um, I'll send them over to Brian and I'll, I'll ask away throughout. Um, but we also have a little bit of time allotted towards the end to do any sort of Q&A session. But um, yeah, well, I think we can go ahead and, and jump in if you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to go through a variety of different aspects related to performance nutrition in active dogs. And so as we, as I set the stage for everybody that's listening, and I, I do really appreciate everyone that has come to listen to this information and um, really want to try to share some some real fundamental understanding of why dogs are such good endurance athletes. And that really is driven by not only their genetics, but also the, the nutrition that they receive. And so that's really going to be a real big part of trying to help everyone understand why performance formulas are made to deliver the nutritional needs that these working dogs have. And so that can be anything from performance dogs to active dogs that are um, involved with trail running, um, any sort of uh, weekend warrior type of activities. Um, and there's a whole, there's a whole range of, of different sorts of things. It doesn't have to be just uh, hunting dogs per se. So all of these uh, active lifestyle activities can really require a lot of calories, but there's also nutritional opportunities to help these dogs really thrive in that type of an active environment. So, so kind of, if you basically think about the first question, you know, why would I need to have a sport formula or a performance formula for my dog if he's really active? And so the primary thing that you want to think about is that these hardworking dogs or very active dogs have a much greater caloric expenditure. Or they, they burn a lot more calories than um than even just general activity and so it's really important to provide these extra calories to that dog it's really amazing how much more calories these these dogs can burn in uh, just by going on on their runs uh over even a period of a half an hour 45 minutes and so that's so that's really um you know really important to help support these these pets and so we really want to think about these sport formulas because they are more nutrient dense, providing more fat and protein. And those are going to be some of the things that that I'll be sharing as to why these performance formulas are really uniquely different than more of a maintenance formula and even some of the uh, uh, the older pet formulas. We go on to the next slide. So so we so I mentioned these formulas have uh, the extra calories to support the extra energy that's burned by these dogs. Uh, 
But what's also really important, and I think probably the more important thing, is that it's actually the proportion of nutrients that um, are actually in the formula that are more tailored to a working dog's metabolism. And that's this, this uh, bullet point on, on the very bottom. So if we think about what are active dogs, you know, whether or not they are doing uh, agility training, uh, whether they're, you're doing, um, like I mentioned earlier, doing trail runs or hiking, you know, going on a hike, you might want to, if, if it's not obvious, you know, you're hiking maybe two or three miles. If the dog is off the leash and running with you, they are probably covering up to 10 to 15 miles during that same uh, distance that you're covering because they are going in a non-linear path. And so we have to take that into consideration that those dogs are really burning a lot of calories and really covering a lot of ground. Um, so when you think about performance dogs, you take that a little bit further and you think about all of the rigorous training that goes into three, four, five days a week, uh, the field trials, the hunt tests, um, canine athletes from the perspective of herding dogs, um, dogs that are really working for an hour, two hours, three hours a day, are really having a, a very demanding amount of caloric needs is also um, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, metabolism that's going on to support that, that physical activity. So that's just kind of uh, just a little uh, frame up of, you know, these different categories and, and all of these dogs really benefit from uh, a more sport performance oriented formula. So before I go into that, I do want to specify that because the sport formulas are more calorically dense, uh, it's really important that we think about the feeding strategy of the dogs. And what I mean by that is with the greater calories comes an importance of making sure that you're feeding the, a, an amount that helps the dog maintain an ideal, ideal body condition. And so what does that mean? So there's been a lot of work done over the last 25 years to really understand what's an ideal body condition of a pet. And so you might have seen this at your veterinarian where they might have talked to you about, you know, a, a body condition score chart. And Purina has a nine point score. Uh, other pet food companies have scoring systems that are on a different numerical scale. But regardless, an ideal body condition score is the same type of shape, might just be a different number, whatever you might be familiar with. So with regards to the Purina scoring system, it's, we want to be right in the middle, this four or five score. And what that means, if you see on this image, three basic elements that you can look for uh, every day as you're petting your dog and, and assessing, is my dog gaining a little bit extra weight? And the reason why I say that is because in the, in the active season or whenever you're really in, uh, active with your pet, uh, you're gonna, the dog might be burning more calories and you're going to need to adjust the amount of food that the dog needs to make sure that they're getting enough calories. And so you can increase their food slightly to make sure that you're giving them the amount of calories that they need at that particular time. And so while the bag might provide a recommendation to say, for my 60 pound Labrador, I should be starting out with two and a half or three cups a day. And that's a starting point. But if you go by the dog's body condition and their individual metabolism, because dogs are individuals, just like we are individuals, it's very much recommended that you make those adjustments based on your own particular pet's needs, whether the what environment you guys live in, uh, the type of activity that they do on a daily basis, you know, how much are they playing with other family members? How much are they playing with other pets? Do you have this dog uh, living outside in the kennel part of the day? You know, that sort of thing. And so obviously all of those things come into consideration with how many calories are burning each day. So the three things that I would recommend to assess whether or not you should increase or slightly decrease the dog's daily food amount. Uh, it is, does their body have an hourglass shape where in the, the middle of their belly, that's the tuck portion between their ribs, which is um, on the outside, it tucks in at their belly and comes out at their hips. So that's from looking from the top down. Uh, the other thing, looking from the side, you can see for the side view, you should also see a tuck in their belly coming up from their rib cage and then it would it would tuck up to their belly. So that that would be uh, number two. And then number three, if you feel their rib cage, and I you know, and this is 
this is probably the easiest one, right? Because you, who doesn't want to pet their dog? So if you're feeling their ribs, you should be able to, uh, you should be able to feel the individual ribs. You don't necessarily have to see them, but you should be able to feel the individual ribs. Uh, that would be a score of five. Score four is if you can see the slight individual ribs uh, there, but the the rest of the the rib cage structure is is not excessively uh, exposed. The dog should be able to stand, maybe breathe, and you should be able to see the ribs. And then maybe when it's standing passively, it uh, you, you might not notice it as much. And that's about a four. So that's just a little bit of something to consider because of these these higher calorie foods in the off season. You would want to drop the food down. If they're burning less calories, they're going to need less calories. You can feed them less and just maintain this ideal body condition score. And that's really the, the most effective way to, um, to know how much to feed on a daily basis. Okay, so we'll jump into this. Um, so we think about optimal nutrition. Now, when, when we're talking to breeders, we're talking to sporting enthusiasts, and they're really wanting to drive their dog to or, or pro- compete in hunt tests, trials, uh, other events where they want an optimal level of performance for their pet. Not only are they working to find the right breeding for genetics for their pet, and on the very bottom, they want to do the, you want to do the training and conditioning to support that pet to be as prepared physically, provide that level of endurance. But the other thing is this point of having the importance of nutrition. And that's really where uh, this last, uh, this line on the bottom where I'm phrasing endurance and optimal performance is actually driven by diet, not just genetics. And that's actually based on nutrition studies uh, over the years that have shown that Labrador retrievers fed a very similar diet will demonstrate the same level of endurance potential with certain measures as do sled dogs, which we know are some of the, the, the greatest endurance athletes in the canine world. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of examples of that particular data to kind of share what uh, I'm referring to. So before we go into that, I uh, just want to set the stage a little bit. So we're thinking about nutrition, we're thinking about the dog's metabolism, we're thinking about why these formulas are the way they are in terms of the amount of protein, the amount of fat, is because we want to be able to support an exercise metabolism for these active dogs. So there's two things that we don't have to go into a lot of detail here, but just in general, uh, want to think about how protein and the protein metabolism is accelerated in these hardworking dogs. Because if you think about it, they're, they're running just like us when we exercise and we maybe go to the gym and we run and we lift weights and we get a little sore, that's our muscles uh, responding to that exercise. And so that soreness is the muscles breaking down naturally because of exercise. So that way the muscles can adapt to make you stronger as part of the conditioning process, right? So that's, so that's our, our, um, our adaptation, our conditioning process. And through that, we uh, have this build up and breakdown of protein that naturally occurs every day. These exercising dogs, think about their protein cycle is working that much faster, okay? So that's protein metabolism. The reason why higher protein is really a value in a performance formula or sport formula. In addition, and this is really, I think one of the key takeaways that I want to share with everyone is that for people, for, for you and I, when we exercise, it's very important that we have uh, carbohydrates in our diet. And that's really valuable to support our ability to exercise effectively. Dogs are uniquely different is that they actually have a preference and a primary use of fat as their driving energy source for exercise and overall daily metabolism. And so as uh, we think about exercise metabolism, you know, we step back for a second. And as I mentioned earlier, dogs are probably the world, one of the world's most um, efficient athletes among all of the animals. And so they really rely on the ability to run long distances um, while probably not having eaten as they're, you know, looking for, if you think about wolves, as they're traversing very long distances um, for prey, then they're really needing to function on their fat stores 
over a longer period of time. And so fat really has become uh, very critical to their metabolism. And so what you see here is what, uh, what we refer to as the cell furnace. So within all the cells, there's a, there's a piece of the cell called a mitochondria. So that's the cell furnace. So you have all the energy nutrients, whether it's fat or carbohydrates or even proteins in some cases, they actually get burned there generates energy for the muscles to actually fire and work and, and move. And then that's where you uh, produce your carbon dioxide, same thing for dogs. And they're using oxygen in this process that gets converted to carbon dioxide. And that's the energy generation system. So these cell furnaces are preferentially using fat in dogs versus where in people, they kind of preferentially use more carbohydrates. Um, and one example that we like to share is that when you think about these cell furnaces and you think about um, the world's most uh, high endurance athlete, all right, we'll think about, um, you know, the best marathon runner, uh, we'll think about uh, the best cyclists, the top athletes in the world are not as metabolically uh, as good, or the, I should say a, a dog couch potato has a better endurance metabolism as measured by the function of these cell furnaces than the best human athletes. And that's been documented uh, across a variety of, um, of research studies. So, so these are really what we think about in terms of how we want to feed a dog to deliver the right nutrition to help these endurance athletes function optimally. So let's go a little bit further. So I've got this little illustration. Those little black dots are the cell furnaces or the mitochondria in the muscle cells. And so I'm going to take you to the next slide and I'll give you a little bit of an explanation of why these cell furnaces are so important with regards to diet. And so as we increase the level of fat in the dog's food, they actually have more fat circulating in their blood system which is ideal because then that actually promotes the dog's metabolism to change. The dog body actually adapts to having a higher fat um, in its uh, consumption every single day. And that's what this illustration on top is, is that dogs that have are on a high carbohydrate diet or more of a maintenance diet will actually have less of these furnaces in their muscles. And as they have get transitioned to a high fat diet, they actually have more of these furnaces. And why is that important? Because the high fat diet is causing their muscles to adapt to a, a metabolism that's more optimal for exercise. So not only are you getting more fat in the dog's system, which it preferentially uses for exercise, but it, the body is also adapting to use that energy source. And then there's a final point, which I referred to before, the difference between Labradors and uh, sled dogs, they actually conducted this study where they fed uh, Labradors a high carbohydrate diet and they had a low amount of these mitochondria, these cell furnaces, uh, and then they fed high fat diet to those same dogs. And those Labradors had the same amount of these cell furnaces or mitochondria in their muscles as did sled dogs on the same diet. And then when they did a performance endurance test where they assessed their level of endurance and how how well they were metabolizing their oxygen and how how far they could go and what was a measure of their their ultra endurance uh, they were actually performing at the same level in fact the labradors were performing slightly better than the sled dogs and so that's um you know this is very interesting to be able to say that it's not just genetics it's actually their nutrition that's really driving part of their ability to be uh, strong athletes. And so we'll go to this next slide and then we'll kind of start to pivot a little bit. How do we measure endurance in a dog? It's actually this what's referred to as VO2 max. And VO2 max means velocity of oxygen metabolism at its maximum rate. And so meaning that the dog can only absorb the oxygen and metabolize it only so fast. And that's partially because there's only so much mitochondria in there. But as you get more mitochondria, the more oxygen that can be metabolized, the more that energy can be generated to support endurance type of activity. 
And so this is one of the ways that uh, people measure their endurance uh, for people. And that's how we also measure it in dogs. And so if you see products that are talking about their performance formulas, more than likely you will see claims and, um, and statements around promoting an improvement in their VO2 max for these athletic dogs. Um, just to round out, so like, what does that mean? So in terms of a performance formula, how do we deliver that? Uh, there are pro plan formulas that are a 30% protein. So you can see that down here on this bottom part, 30% protein and 20% fat. That's what that ratio means. 30, 20, 30, 20 is the performance formula. We also have an active formula and the 27, 17 means 27% protein, 17% fat. And those are higher levels than more maintenance, non-sport related formulas that can be 26% um, protein, 16% fat, 26 protein, 14% fat. Uh, so you can see that the, the less uh, the amount of fat is in the formula, the less it's targeted for uh, an athletic pet. And in addition, there's other nutrition that comes along with these diets we want to you want to look for nutrition that helps joints, whether that's glucosamine or, or fish oil. Uh, you can also look for uh, other healthy fats, that omega-6s and vitamin A, that's very important for skin health and that sort of thing. So there's other uh, nutritional attributes that also help support a performance pet uh, besides just their total amount of, of protein and fat. So I, again, I met, already mentioned, look for the... Uh, that's where the support for these VO2 max types of claims come from, because we're really trying to drive that endurance potential of the fat of the pet coming from this higher level of, of fat, but also from the higher level of protein. Okay, final slide on nutrition. Um, let me just basically say that there's always a question that comes up is, do I feed my dog a non performance formula in the off season? And I always provide the recommendation of no, you want to keep your active dog on a performance formula or a sport formula all year round. And the reason for that is because it can take a month and a half to two months for those muscles to adapt to that new diet, to that high fat diet, for all those cell furnaces to accumulate. So not only is it adaptation through conditioning and exercise, there's also adaptation to the diet, it's not the same thing as going from one diet where you're saying, okay, I'm going to feed this food, this chicken and rice food or whatever, and I'm going to switch to this other product. And, you know, we always try to advocate for, you know, we'll take a week to a week and a half to adjust them to the new food. So it doesn't upset their stomach because a variety of formulas can have different fiber sources, different carbohydrate sources, different protein uh, that are in the blend that can maybe upset their, the dog's stomach. That's diet transition from a digestibility standpoint. Diet transition from a muscle adaptation is really a two month process. And so that's the whole basis behind keeping the dog on a performance formula or a sport formula all year round, which if we go back to the point at the early part of the talk to share, when you're adjusting, you want to adjust the dog's portion of food to make sure that you're meeting their body condition score, keeping that hourglass shape, regardless of whether you're feeding two cups a day or three cups a day or four cups a day or six cups a day, depending on how active your particular dog is, depending on how big their dog, your dog is and how much uh, calories they need to sustain that active lifestyle and that endurance metabolism. And so the reason why I also bring that up and that brings me to more specifically on this slide I always like to say that while the dog can adapt forward, it can improve its muscle adaptation to this performance food. When you switch them to a maintenance formula, you are basically detraining your dog's muscles. All right. So you're putting them back in an unconditioned metabolic state by being on that more high carbohydrate diet versus when they're on the higher fat diet. So we always, so that's, it's, there's multiple reasons, you know, to really consider maintaining on a performance food all year round, just adjusting based on their energy needs. In summer, they're gonna be less active, it's gonna be warmer, they're gonna need less food, you would feed them less, whether that is uh, a cup, whether it's a half, a half a cup, whether it's a cup and a half uh, less, 
just go down gradually to keep their body condition score at the ideal range. And if you uh, please feel free to, you know, talk about this with your veterinarian, um, you know, you get a, a better feel for that assessment and they're well versed in that. They can definitely provide you some with some additional uh, feedback and, and tips for your own pet. OK, so that's on the food. Um, I do want to spend the next 15, 10 minutes or so just sharing some uh, some really important, I think, tips that are going to be of value for everyone, particularly as we're hiking, we're spending time in the summer on trails uh, and even in the winter. But the importance of hydration and how to really uh, be cautious and some tips to understand some of the things that you can look for to make sure that your dog is staying hydrated, uh, when to give them a break how much to help them stay hydrated with as you're going down your, uh, as you're going through your, your activity, whatever it is over the course of the day, over the course of the weekend, and that sort of thing. Um, so let's jump into that. And just to start it off. So, okay, so let's think about exercise. So exercise in and of itself increases the dog's amount of water they need on a daily basis. So that's what increasing their, their water requirement is. Um, obviously, the more intense and the longer duration that they exercise, the more that their body stores of water are going to be depleted. And if you think about how dogs lose water, they lose water. 90% of the source comes from them panting and losing water through evaporative process. Well, it's not quite 90 because they're also urinating quite a, uh, a bit of water that way, but they do not sweat. Um, and so you really want to focus on how uh, how much the dog is panting, you wanna be able to kind of keep an idea or kind of keep um, keep an eye out for um, what might be uh, some overheating. And so there's some things to look for there, but definitely the more they exercise, obviously the more they're losing water. And part of the tips are gonna be how to take into consideration the amount of time and what intervals of rest are gonna be uh, valuable. Another thing to consider is that about 70 degrees is what's considered a thermoneutral temperature. So that's about the temperature where the dog doesn't have to cool down and it doesn't have to try to heat up it or maintain its body temperature to, um, to stay warmer or stay cooler. So that's kind of what's called thermal neutral. So as it gets to where the dog is outside to 75, 80 degrees, the dog, just by the purpose of being in a warmer environment, is going to start panting to stay, try to stay cool. And so um, so that's something to think about as you're going out to exercise. Even 75, 76, 78 degrees can be a significant addition of uh, causing excess water loss besides just the fact that the dog is exercising. And um, I'll be going back to this, but I want to just state it here to get it started one liter of water is uh, needed for the dog on an average per 1000 kilocalories that the dog would eat per day. So uh, that might not really understand those numbers just yet, but we'll walk through those in a second. But it's this one to one ratio of how many calories a dog is eating per day. That's how much at rest the dog on average should need and should receive, should be drinking uh, voluntarily to meet its water requirements. All right, so how does how do we translate that into our own individual dogs? So we think about a 16 ounce bottle of water, it's approximately 500 milliliters of water. And so we have put some estimates down here across the slide and there's different body weights of the different pets. And that would be the equivalent amount of water that on average they should be drinking voluntarily per day to have that one-to-one -one ratio. So then the question you might have is, well, how do I determine how many calories my dog is consuming every day to know if they're getting this? And so on the product, on the bag of food that you have, or you call the, the pet food company, it will indicate the number of uh, MEK cals per cup of food. Okay. And so there's uh, so many kcals or kilocalories or calories, however you want to, uh, there's multiple ways to refer to it, the number of calories that they're gonna consume per day. So if you know on a daily basis, you're feeding your dog two cups of food per day, and that is just right for their body condition score, then 
that two cups of food would have X amount of calories. And so that X amount of calories would be the number of milliliters that that dog should be drinking per day. Now I know that the typical recommendation is to always have free, always have water available in their bowl to let them drink as much as they want on a daily basis. And that's absolutely true. But why this is important to share is that this begins to start to help you as a pet owner that's, you know, wanting to maintain an active uh, role in, or in the lifestyle with your active pet, kind of get an idea of how much the dog might be losing as you go out and exercise and approximately how much you might want to keep in mind or think about would need to be replenished as you're being um, very active with your pet. So this is uh so this will go from here. This is our starting point. One mill one milliliter of water per what's called one K cal, but you may actually uh, see it as one calorie. So um, that would be the, the equivalent name. It's just a short name for that. Um, so let's go on to this. So I've got a couple of scenarios here and there is taking into consideration how much water is lost when the dog exercises. So exercising for 30 to 60 minutes, uh, in a temperature that's slightly above thermal neutral, so 70 to 80 degrees. Uh, so just in that 30 minutes to 60 minutes, the dog can become mildly dehydrated between two to 5% dehydration. Of course, that depends on how intensely they're act exercising, what's the temperature outside, how well conditioned they are, how well hydrated they are uh, before starting. All of those things play a role. So if we look at this uh, down here, then let's start with this 50 pound dog or we'd start with the 70 pound, 70 pound dog. That's more closer to my black lab. Um, that dog is approximately going to have 50 to 70% of its uh, uh, body is, is body water. Okay. So then that equates to uh, about half of its weight. So 70 pounds, half of its water is, we'll go with 35, 35 pounds. Okay. If it becomes 2% dehydrated, okay, then you've got, you go all the way over and the dog can be losing between 300 and 400 milliliters of water that can be lost per day. So if you think about um, just to replace the dog's amount of water, they would need to be consuming approximately two thirds uh, to maybe a half of a full bottle of a 16 ounce uh, bottle of water. That's for a 70, 70 pound dog after about 30 minutes uh, to 60 minutes of exercise, depending. Okay, so let's just keep that, keep that in mind. Um, now, obviously, if they're getting slightly more dehydrated, that's quite a bit more water to try to replace. What we're going to go next is you don't want to try to replace all of this water loss all at once because the dog will actually not fully replenish uh, all at, in one intake, um, just because the dog will not want to drink that full amount all at one time. So it's much better to give them uh, smaller amounts um, over a period of time at, at a lower, uh, a more frequent interval than all at, all at one time. All right, let's go through here. Um, I don't know how many of you are really going to be able to do this, but if you were so inclined, um, if you were to go out for a run, say you like to run, um, I like to go out for my dog, out for a run or jog with my dog and he runs with me and I'll be gone for, um, maybe a couple of miles, come back. If you were so inclined to try to understand maybe after a hike, how much water loss they, um, water was lost during that run, you could weigh them. If you had a scale, you could weigh them before you left and then weigh them when you come back Now, provided the dog is still dry. Um, the amount of weight loss that would occur on that run would be equal to the amount of water loss. There's not going to be any other water, well, I mean, unless they, you know, had a bowel movement, but you know, the majority of it would be, uh, associated with, with water loss. So this is where I think there's going to be some really, uh, valuable tips for you to try to take into consideration to assess whether or not your dog is, um, where they're at in terms of their level of dehydration as you're exercising, some things to consider. So we did run a study several years ago where we were starting to look at the color of the dog's urine, actually, which is this one up here. So if we see, 
Um, this is the concentration of the dog's urine. You can see all these different color scales. That color scale is actually a human urine color scale. And this is what's used to assess level of, of hydration in people. It just so happens that this color scale works really well for dogs in terms of trying to assess approximately where their dehydration status or level of, of concentrated urine would be. Now for a dog, we really wanna be in this two to three and a half range. So the light colored urine, uh, when we're getting into this uh, four, five, six, where it's pretty dark, that level of, of urine is pretty concentrated. So it's gonna be getting closer to a level of, of dehydration. So if you see that your dog is urinating and it's pretty dark uh, yellow, is something to be aware of, knowing that probably want to be able to help your dog get a little bit better hydrated uh, before it goes out on any sorts of athletic activities. Okay. Um, now, when you're in the field, one of the things that we discovered when we were working with sporting dogs, uh, dogs that were training for search and rescue uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, there's actually a, a center there that that trains dogs for uh, police work, for uh, border detection, for um, uh, drug detection, that sort of thing. And as these dogs come in every single day and, and they get trained, we can also evaluate over the course of their, their training, are they getting enough water? And we are trying to keep them hydrated during their exercises. But what we did observe is that very, um, mild levels of dehydration can occur even after just 15 minutes. And one of the ways that we were able to demonstrate the slight range of dehydration, which say down here, which was at 1%, uh, is with this skin pinch on the top of the dog's head. Now, if you take your dog, you know, right now they're sitting next to you, you know, and you just gently grab their skin and, and you just pinch and just try to lift it up gently. It should snap right back. It should go right back down to the top of their head. After the dog exercises and, and becomes this level of, of approximately 1% dehydrated, you will notice it start to stay up like that. And so it's a really good indicator that the dog is losing body water and is starting to become dehydrated. Now, 1% dehydration is not what we would normally consider clinically significant. It's what's considered below mild dehydration. There's mild, there's moderate, and there's severe. Mild dehydration is typically associated with um, about 3 to 5% dehydration, about 5 to 10% is moderate, and then above 10% level of dehydration is very severe and life-threatening. So obviously we want to be able to have these tips and these field assessment tools to be able to see where your pet is at. So that way we can get well ahead of preventing this any dehydration that can accumulate and get to that two or three or four or five percent level of dehydration where you have to try to get the dog that replenished in, in water that much more. So so you might want to look, so look for that. We found that that's a, a really good tool. Another tool, another way that your vet might assess uh, dehydration in the clinic is by um, pressing the gums of their in their mouth. What we actually found is that that method is not as sensitive when the dogs are only very mildly dehydrated like this. It's not sensitive enough to to show that. So the pinkness will return to their gums at this level. And so you might do that and you might say, oh, well, my dog's hydrated. Fine. It's, it went back to normal just fine. And so, in fact, this kind of gives us a little bit of an indication of where, where the pet is at. That's, that's in the field. Now, if you go a little bit further, I think it is really important to also share. There were studies that were done to really start to understand at what point the dog might become dehydrated, but also at what point the dog might start to become overheated. And obviously, heat stress is one of the number one significant uh, risk factors that we want to take into consideration when we're out with our dog. Obviously, being dehydrated can significantly exacerbate heat stress and get to a point of, of heat stroke. We don't want to get to that point, which is why we want to be able to assess their level of dehydration early on. But we also want to be able to assess where the dog's body temperature is without potentially needing to have a thermometer, which is having a thermometer is perfectly acceptable. Um, but some dogs are maybe not going to respond very well to putting an ear, a thermometer in their ear to get an ear uh, temperature reading or 
you know, they definitely probably not going to want you to put a thermometer, use a rectal thermometer on them. But clearly that's what the, the clinicians do um, in the vet clinic in the field. Not so much. But when the dog's running, one of the ways that we can we can assess them by looking at their tongue. Now, you will often see the dog is running around and their tongue is hanging out of their mouth and it's, it's hanging off to the side. And it's kind of limp. And that's OK. But what I want to show in these pictures is I want you to pay attention to is that when the dog starts to get a little bit too overheated and it really is time to give them a break is when they start to make this curling uh, formation in their tongue. They're really trying to spread out that uh, tongue to expand the, the vasculature as much as possible, get as much air exposure to that, um, to that tongue as much as possible, not only to the top, but also underneath. So they're getting as much cool evaporative cooling processes that's going on. So that's something that I think is, you know, is something to, to uh, you know, be aware of as you're out, again, can really avoid this by stopping the dog every 15 minutes and giving them a little bit of water to drink. So let's go into the tips. Now they have shown you a couple of, of things to look for in your pet with regards to hydration and, and body temperature. Really wanna think about these frequent small volumes of water that can be provided over the course of whatever activity you're doing with your pet really want to think about this 15 to 20 minute interval as being um, the time period where it would be minimally appropriate um, depending on the level of intensity the temperature outside there there are opportunities where the dog could safely go for 60 minutes even that's not exactly um, ideal particularly depending on on how intense the, the dog is is exercising but um, if it was just a small trot and the dog was just slightly trotting with you, probably could very easily go, especially if the dog was well conditioned, could go for an hour without necessarily taking a break. But a good rule of thumb is 15 to 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. I mean, there's no reason not to stop the dog, be able to give them a little squirt of water from a dedicated water bottle in the back of their mouth and help them uh, get a little bit more rehydrated. The other benefit there, too, is that it also helps cool the back of their throat and helps bringing their their body temperature down a little bit. One thing that I would also mention, some people like to put ice in their dog's bottle in the dog's bowl. Um, I am personally am not an advocate of that. Um, just like people, dogs can get head rushes from consuming very cold water too quickly. And if you think about what's happening there. You know, their vasculature at the back of their throat is as expanded as possible to allow as much cooling as, as can occur. And they're trying to cool their body off primarily through the back of their throat. By having a very, very cold uh, uh, amount of water in the back of their throat will cause those vasculature to constrict. And that can uh, reduce blood flow to the brain. And I have seen some dogs which really feel quite uncomfortable if consuming uh, excessively cold ice water when they're overheated. So I would not advocate for ice cold water. I do advocate for cool water uh, or, or room temperature water, uh, but not necessarily ice cold water just for, for that excessive constriction risk. Um, how much is, is small? Okay, this kind of goes back to the example that I had. Um, we use that 50 pound dog. Uh, 1% uh, body water loss. So 1% of that 50 pounds is 0.07 of body weight. Um, and so then you, I'm sorry, that's 0.07% uh, body weight. So it's 0.35 pounds, which is equivalent to 150 milliliters of water. So, so think about it this way. The dog runs for 15 minutes. It's going to lose approximately 1% body water. So what would 1% body weight of that 50 pound dog be? It'd be 150 milliliters to try to get that replenished. That's not very much, uh, something that uh, you could easily, uh, over a five, 10 minute break, squirt in the back of their mouth if they're not an advocate, uh, if they're not a voluntary drinker. I've had dogs that, you know, you could put water down, they could be 
almost passing out from dehydration and, and overheating and they won't drink the water. So, um, so the, I, I know that frustration of, of being out in the field and trying to encourage them to drink. So that's where the bottle of water comes in. Uh, and also opportunities where you can also use low sodium chicken broth to kind of bait the water. That would be another approach uh, if you wanted to add that to the bowl to, to get them to drink. Uh, but before, if you have a dog that's really excessively panting, um, you want to allow that dog to get its respiratory rate under control a little bit. So giving them a chance to kind of slow that down. Uh, you don't want that dog to over consume the excess water when it's when it's just stopping. Uh, you don't want the dog to vomit. You don't want the dog to aspirate on that extra water if they're too enthusiastic about drinking. So um, just some things to consider. Uh, like to give the dog maybe about five minutes or so to, to start to kind of cool down by itself. And then obviously after you've gone through the initial rehydration uh, event, make sure that water is freely available. Um, and one thing that, you know, to reiterate, if you the dog has run, the dog has exercised, and you put free water available to, to let it drink what it feels comfortable with. Nutrition studies have demonstrated that the dog will not adequately rehydrate itself for more than 24 hours after that event, particularly if they've become uh, in that five to 7% dehydration zone. It's just physically their body will tell them they're full before they're fully rehydrated. So that's why it's so important to try to m support that, that uh, hydration uh, replenishment during the process, which is why I've got this up here, better to maintain in terms of its hydration status than trying to regain it. Um, and then I've got this graph, another study that we did just real briefly, and then we're, we're at the end, is basically showing that after a 20-minute exercise, again, the 20-minute exercise here was the dogs did about uh, five minutes of agility, they did um, a couple of minutes rest, and they did five minutes of search on uh, in their search area and then they did about 10 minutes of retrieving and so just combining all of that those three types of exercises into a 20 minute uh set of exercise their body temperature um you know going up to 105 106 degrees and what you can see here and i thought this i thought this was interesting to share with you is that the dog's body temperature is not going to go down even if it right when it stops okay so if you think about it the fact that it has stopped running and its respiratory rate has slowed down its body is still heated up and so the slower respiratory rate actually allows less cooling through its evaporative process through its mouth okay so its body temperature is actually starting to creep up a little bit and so then at this uh five minutes after uh, the water was offered to the pet. They were given an opportunity to drink. And then what you can see is by 15 minutes, uh, their body temperature has gone down significantly back to baseline. All right. And so then you, we do see um, a little bit of bump up uh, because it, it over it overcooled because the water was cooler than the dog's body temperature. And this temperature is actually being measured uh, in the in the um, intestine of the pet, they actually have these uh, digest these indigestible or indigestible pills. They actually measure body temperature. They swallow the pill and then they poop the pill out. But have, while it's going through the dog's um, intestinal tract, it actually measures their temperature. So you can actually get a measurement of where their body temperature is at the most core level of their of their gastrointestinal tract. And so what you're seeing here is that that cooling effect from the water. And then as the water helps support, uh, then the body temperature after rest starts to stay at its recovery zone and normal baseline. So just some little information there. I thought that might be kind of interesting. Uh, and it's the last slide. And we think about all the different types of dogs that are exercising their extra caloric needs that they that uh, require those extra um calories for endurance, whether it's sled dogs, you can see uh, three to five times their normal resting metabolic needs, uh, hounds, uh, working livestock or herding dogs. Uh, then you've got field trials, you know, one and a half to two and a half times uh, extra 
uh, caloric needs beyond their, their resting energy requirement. Um, and again, you, you can see that this significant caloric increase is even with these dogs that are sprint racing dogs. So even though these dogs are racing for a very, very short period of time, they're, um, and they're considered, you know, low endurance dogs, they are still expending a significant amount of exercise uh, during that period, particularly with those um, frequent uh, short bursts of intense activity. So again, the whole spectrum of, of working dogs, athletic dogs, active dogs really benefit from a sport formula with the added fat, the extra protein to not only provide the calories, but to also provide them with the right nutrition to allow their muscles to adapt to an exercising metabolism and an endurance type of performance. And with that, I will wrap up. Um, I hope this was really informative for you, kind of give you some scientific basis for why the performance and sport formulas are the way they are, because obviously being a, a sporting enthusiast myself, you know, I want my dog to perform the best it possibly can when it's out in the field and I want it to enjoy uh, and be as healthy and possible, be as healthy and as strong as possible when it's out there. So um, I hope you can too. I hope you learned a lot. And uh, please, by all means, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to ask away. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Brian. That was awesome. I feel like I just learned so much. So I was like trying to digest it myself and figure out what questions I had. Um, I, I've got a couple. I'll start just in order of how the presentation float starting with some nutrition pieces um i was curious slash just in general um when it comes to my own dogs so they eat twice a day once at noon once in the evening i've always wondered like when we're going out for like an entire day on the river like we're going to be gone all day kind of thing I always question when to feed them, like if I should feed them their normal amount or like their lunch before we go and we should take food with us to try and stick to a schedule or anything like that. So I was just curious if you had any general recommendations for like day of their activity or event, whatever that may be, um, tips yeah. for feeding them that day. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's a question that comes up a lot. So for being gone all day, I think there's a couple of things I would recommend is the night before, I would definitely add water to the dog's food in their, their meal evening to really help get that extra water in their system. So that way they can start the next day a little bit more hydrated. Um, but if you're when you go out the next morning or the next day, and it's really going to be a full day, I would advocate for not feeding them in the morning because it's much better for the dog's ability to exercise and it's better for their health from the standpoint of not having a full meal in their stomach when they exercise. And the reason for that is because we don't want to have all that extra bulk in their stomach, which can really cause stomach upset. And in some cases, it's been uh, associated with an increased risk of stomach torsion. And so we really want to kind of prevent any of those or minimize any of those risk factors. And so, but most importantly, the, the dog's endurance potential is going to be much stronger. They're going to be much more comfortable um, not having eaten and then feeding them after they're done exercising. Um, and so that's really what we recommend all the time for people with active and sporting dogs is that when they're going out to hunt, when they're going out to work, that they would not eat before that they would eat right after, uh, not immediately after you want to focus on hydration and getting them cool down, but within 20 minutes, uh, after they cool down, that would be a good time to feed them their meal that day. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I was trying to think if, if I had any other follow ups on that one, but I don't think so. Um, but we did just get a good question to come through. And I think it, it speaks to just kind of what's going out there on the industry. Um, how do you feel about the recent raw food diet? Um, kind of trend going on right now and, and how those formulas or whatnot, how they kind of compare to, to that side of things. Well, I mean, so the raw diets, as long as they're complete and balanced and formulated by a reputable company and, you know, they have all of the protein and fat and other vitamins and minerals 
then as long as they're getting all of the appropriate nutrition, I think they're they're fine. The other, the only there are risks associated with raw diets. I mean, obviously that comes along with um, the bacterial risk and and that sort of thing that can cause illness. Um, so there are dis, those are some of the disadvantages. But in terms of if the diet is formulated appropriately, then um, there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. Um, but there again, there there are pros and cons. You know, there's a safety factor with uh, with raw diets that. It's definitely something that uh, you have to take into consideration for sure. Yeah, I think you know, breaking down the fat and protein content was really cool. It just makes me think about like some friends in my network that are super into their own fitness and health and their own specialized diets based on their activity levels. So I think it's just really cool to to break it down from that standpoint and identify what exactly is needed and, and how do you fill it through whatever means feel appropriate for, for each person and their dog. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, cool. I think that was most of the food related. So I'll jump over to a couple of hydration points. One, I just wanted to feel better about myself because I think you just made it apparent that like dogs need a little bit of help when it comes to regulating their body temperature, because I think, a lot of times I step in and I'm like, oh, my dog needs to go inside. They're too hot or forcing my dog to drink water. Some people are like, oh, my gosh, that looks mean. And I'm like, no, he needs it. Like, I feel like there's that that point that it, it was nice to see that like dogs won't necessarily self-regulate all the time, especially while they're out doing the thing that they love. So feeling like you're you're empowered to step in and know when when they need you feels feels really nice. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, having been in that situation myself and seeing all of there, I mean, that's something that's pretty common, you know, being out in the field with a lot of people that I've, I've been out hunting with, or, um, you know, out at the dog park, you know, you think about the dogs at the dog park, you know, they're running around being very enthusiastic and, you know, really wanting to play, right. They're really wanting to participate in all of the excitement that's going on, you know, and trying to get them to take a drink, that's like trying to get your toddler to listen when you're at the store and they want a toy, right? They're just, they want that candy, that, which is the candy for the dog is they want to play. So to get them to really drink um, can sometimes be a challenge. I mean, some dogs are very good at voluntarily responding to their thirst sensations and some dogs uh, can be quite challenging. So that's really where, you know, having that dedicated water bottle or having something that you know, you can add to the dog's water to enhance their desire to drink just to kind of keep them, um, you know, better hydrated. It, it's really valuable for their overall health and then it's going to help them recover. And so it's just well, just something to, to be just be aware of, you know. Yeah, I think your point on adding chicken broth to their water, it's really interesting. I've never tried that because Burr is not the biggest drinker, but Guinness will drink all the water. So that's an interesting one, but it, and your point of adding water to their food reminded me of, um, one of my old friends who was big into the upland bird hunting side, he used to soak their food in water the night before. I've seen some things about how long to soak the food for, if you should let it like soak to mush or put water right before they eat. Do you have any like recommendations on if if one is a little better than the other for trying to add that extra hydration in so i so there's definitely something to consider there you know, adding the water for the purpose of getting the hydration is is obviously important if it gets to mush then um you know if it's a periodic thing it's not a big deal but if it's something where it's always getting to that soft point then you lose the 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 dog food's ability to have cleaning and abrasive type of benefits for dental uh, support for the dogs. So by by losing that rigid structure, then that mechanical action starts to go away. But if it's just something where it's periodic, um, then it, it really wouldn't, you know, a one-time thing or very infrequent thing really wouldn't um, be one or the other. It, it really wouldn't matter, whatever the pet's preference is. I know for myself, I float my dog's food every single day. He just happened to be such an aggressive eater with dry food that 
he would suck in so much air. And again, that's been associated with, you know, a, a risk factor with, with, of bloat is that so much atmospheric air gets trapped in their, in their stomach and, you know, that, that gulping and that sort of thing. So it's just like anything you can do to, because it's really not known like what causes that. It is like all these little risk factors that have been associated with it uh, through the different studies. And, and um, so the point is, is that to slow him down, I actually put water in his food bowl every single day. And that actually makes a very significant slowdown between like putting two cups in and having him finish it within 30 seconds versus having him finish it within two to three minutes. So it really forces him to kind of lick the lick the water, kind of bring it down, softens it up, and then can can consume it like a normal dog instead of like a maniac. So, you know. With some extra benefits than just the the busy bowls or the slow feeder yeah. bowls. So now That's those, are, those are other that. yes, those are other good alternatives for sure. Sure. Yeah, I didn't think about using water for that trick. That's that's an interesting one. That's I like that. Um, one question that might kind of play with that: What are your thoughts on dry versus wet food? Should we feed both? Are there any pros and cons to either? I think that that dental point is interesting, but didn't know if it kind of like played a part in in this piece. Yeah, so definitely dental. Um, I mean, there's no reason, if, especially for some dogs, where um, there's been a, there's been a variety of situations over the years where we have folks that have really high drive dogs and they have really, I don't call them poor appetites, but they're just they're not good eaters. I mean, let's just admit it. I mean, you could try 15 different dog foods, and you just just the dog is just not an enthusiastic eater. But sometimes. You have a wet food and it can really provide that level of enticement that can help. So in that case, it's a good additive. It does help bring in some extra protein. Um, and some of the, maybe some of the disadvantages of uh, soft food exclusively is that you do end up having to feed that much more uh, actual food. It does get more expensive. There's um, there's obviously there's there's more water in that because it's a wet food, but then you have to physically feed more to get all of the calories um, consumed. It tends to also have a little bit more um, different fiber composition. And so for some dogs, they might be a little bit more sensitive on their stomach to, so in a wet food, you would probably want to make sure that you add that in slowly. So that way the, the dog's bacteria and microbiome in their gut has time to adjust. And so you don't get the soft stool type of issues. So it's definitely, you definitely do it. I know a lot of people that, that do it as an add on um, for, for palatability enhancement for whatever food they're on or just for preference, which is perfectly fine too. Um, I would say if you're going to do that, I would leverage um, a more super premium type wet food as opposed to a wet food that's maybe more tailored to um, a non-sporting dog, um, because it's going to have, it's going to have less protein content. It's going to have a little bit more on the carbs. And so it just, you know, always being mindful of the amount of protein and the amount of fat is really going towards the sporting dog. So, so yeah, so, I mean, it just, it has its pros and cons. Yeah. I think back to, back to that piece of the nutrition and where, where it makes sense for the activity levels and all that. Mm -hmm. What another thing that wet wet food comes in good and is is handy is it kind of to your example earlier we said well we're going to be gone all day and you know we're going to start the event or we're going to go out and we're going to be in the field from I don't know ten o'clock until like maybe four right and so if you don't really want to give your dog a big meal um, during the day wet food if they're used to eating wet food or wet food combined with you know maybe a quarter of a cup to an eighth of a cup of their dry food, small portion, just to kind of maybe give them a little bit of support energy boost over the course of the day, especially if they're not used to eating once a day. Mm -hmm. um, that can be something where it kind of help bridge the gap a little bit. So in that case, it's not a full meal, but the wet food is a really good, um, it's really enhancement, provide a little bit of extra energy without, but remember in that case, it, it really is a small portion of what the dog would normally get on a meal it's not it's not a meal replacement it's it's just an additive for extra nourishment and that calories in that yeah in that particular moment versus 
their meal for the day. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're close to time, but we did get one extra one I might want to ask because I think it's a good one. Um, Alex asked, do you have any puppy food recommendations for a hunting dog before the 30-20 formula? So, Alex, that's a great question. And so there are a variety of formulas, and particularly our 30-20 formulas are what are called all-like stages, and meaning that they're uh, nutritionally balanced to support a puppy's needs. And so depending on how active the pet is, how active your puppy is, and how much uh, it it's doing training and, and that sort of thing, a 30-20 formula could be perfectly fine uh, for your dog. Um, the balance really comes with, so a puppy formula is typically going to have about 28% protein and 18% fat. That's a typical puppy formula. It's a little bit lower on the protein, a little bit lower on the fat than a performance formula. Um, and part of that is because we want to be able to match the amount of protein and calories to the proper growth rate of the puppy. The biggest contributor to hip issues years ago was not only an imbalance in calcium and, and phosphorus in the diet, which caused some, some growth abnormalities in their bone structure, but it was also because they were getting too many calories in the food. Um, and so they were, their muscles were actually growing too rapidly and it was not allowed, it wasn't growing at the same pace. Now that's not the case anymore. All of the puppy formulas that I'm aware of, most of the, pup, the pet food companies are are, are formulating to AFCO, which is the regulatory body for nutrition for pets, meeting a certain requirement of calories and nutritional balance. So, so you can very comfortably uh, feed a puppy formula for an active puppy. You could very comfortably feed the 30-20 formula. The key always is to feed the puppy to the ideal body condition score. And I know that that can be kind of challenging because, you know, that puppy is growing so fast and you you have to make those adjustments. You have to say, okay, you know, between eight weeks and 12 weeks, I'm feeding so much, you know, I'm feeding three times a day and then it's going to grow and you're going to kind of see it's going to kind of get a little chubby and then it's going to get a little thin. And it's going to get a little chubby and it's going to get a little thin. So you're kind of always playing this game of feeding more to meet its growth rate. And so that's why really being in tune with its body condition and watching it grow and making those slight adjustments, um, almost any of the uh, the pro, uh, any of the pro plan puppy formulas are going to be ideal for that but again you probably want to look for a 2818 now if it's a large breed or an extra large breed those puppy formulas are going to be about the same protein level they're going to be a slightly lower fat exactly for the reason i was mentioning is that you're going to have less calories because you don't want those larger breed dogs to grow too fast and so but again, it's all going to be dependent on how many calories they're getting, how many calories they're burning, and keeping their ideal body condition um, consistent over the course of that that growth period. So um, I know it's kind of a long-winded answer, but I wanted to kind of you know kind of give a couple of different uh, perspectives on on that. So, um, but any particular puppy recommendation, pu puppy food? Um, I mean, not particular. I mean, if there, there's, um, I mean, there's a variety of them out there. Um, the Pro Plan, the Purina One. Uh, I know a variety of the other competitor products uh, have really good puppy foods. So, not going to discount any of those either. It's all going to be based on the preference of what you want and what your dog likes and what your dog, you know, prefers and is comfortable eating. Again, it's all about feeding to the proper body condition score of a, of a super premium food, and they're going to get everything they need. So. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for all this, and thank you, everyone, that joined and popped questions in. I know that optimal health score has been huge. I think it's been part of the conversations with my dogs as they've gotten older. I don't even like to call them older, but after they hit – six years our last visit we've started having more of those conversations and they told me around five percent five percent if they're starting to look a little over or a little under you can adjust five percent feels like a good range so that's what my vet told me everybody consult yours but i know as you were talking about increase decrease and what amount that actually 
looks like will vary for everyone, but um, super, super great information. I, I learned a whole lot, so I'm sure everybody else did too. Um, any, any last thoughts or anything like that from you, Brian? Um, no, I just, um, you know, everybody be safe. You know, I hope you took away, um, at least one or two tips that I think, I hope you could use for your own pet. Um, you know, something that you can share with somebody else. Um, but, um, if the one thing is, you know, consult with your veterinarian, um, assess what ideal body condition score is for your dog that four to five range and make those adjustments as the dog's need changes over the course of the year and um all the best of luck to everybody so cool well thank you again thank you everyone this should live on the orvis site so um the the recording will be there but everyone have a great rest of your evening and it was a pleasure brian thank you again Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful being here. Cool. Have a great evening.